So it's just kind of interesting because I feel like you know this is this is a new experience for me. And one of the things that I wanted to do was also give an introduction to my organism of choice. I'm going to turn things down just a tad more because I've got some. There we go. So I am. Um, I work on Mexicacus anthus, and Mexicacus anthus is a little different than the last bacteria we just, we just talked about because, um, well, for, for those of you in the audience that care, it's a gram-negative delta proteobacteria, which tells you something about sort of its structure. And for example, Mexicacus anthus, I think, actually stands for gold slime rod. And so you can see that it's, it's rod-shaped. Uh, let's see if I can actually make that do that again. Um, it moves by a form of motility called gliding motility. Now, there's some... There's some uh, controversy about exactly what that means, but for the point of this talk, it doesn't really matter. Uh, suffice to say, it can't swim. What it can do is that it, it moves along a semi-solid surface, like an agar surface, and uh, and it can it moves along its leading edge or its, its leading pole, and then it can reverse direction occasionally, which you were watching it do there. And then the last thing is that it doesn't exist in in the form you just saw it in as sort of individual cells that doesn't really occur in nature. It exists almost entirely in, uh, in isogenic biofilms that are called swarms. And I'm hoping that's not good. I don't want to shut down. I'll log out. Are you saying other universities have better uh, <laughs> projection than Syracuse? <laughs> All right. What I'm going to do is <laughs> I'm going to keep talking, actually, and we're going to pretend like I'm giving this talk. Uh, well, all right, so okay. So like I said, Mexicacus anthus exists in isogenic biofilm called the swarm. And the thing that Mexicacus anthus does that sort of puts it on the map in terms of, um, in terms of self organizing systems is that, uh, is that a biofilm of Mexicacus or a swarm of Mexicacus anthus, uh, when you start it, will self organize into uh, sort of mushroom shaped uh, structures that are called fruiting bodies. Each fruiting body contains 100,000 cells, approximately, that were once sort of relatively evenly dispersed throughout a swarm. I'm kind of terrified right now. Um, I really don't want to run FSDK, but I think I'll have to. And while my computer is vomiting, um, I'm going to keep on going, and we'll just pick up where we have to. Oh. Yes, please fix everything. I don't want to give you my root password. <laughs> what I want to do is just have you restart and you want. And then this is going to truly be a sure moment. I have it on an SD card that somebody would have to have open office. Alright, if this asks me for my root password again, we'll do that. <laughs> Bill Gates has been in, and only Linux and Mac have given problems so far. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Gates has infiltrated these things. <laughs> All 
That's the last time I go back and run a movie around. Right? sort of <clears throat> quintessential introductory slide to a Mixococcus talk. Uh, the mix of bacteria, this, this represents a schematic of the enzyme display cycle. So uh, when there is sufficient food, uh, they grow what is called vegetatively. There's a microcolony that is swarming on nutrient auger. If you introduce, the, the, if you introduce uh, nutrient stress in the form of starvation, it will go through a series of patterns, which we'll get into more detail in just a second, but the sort of most pronounced of which is the formation of traveling waves. Uh, these are actually non zabotinsky waves. And uh, following the formation of waves, they will begin to form these aggregates. Now, these are actually um, scanning electron micrographs of, of, of uh, Mzanthus swarms forming one of these aggregates. So the aggregates continue to grow and begin to rise off the surface of the agar plate and eventually form uh, a mature fruiting body. This is actually almost visible to the naked eye. It's about one tenth of a millimeter across. So in, inside the fruiting body, uh, the cells on the interior of it will actually change shape and, and become rounded and uh, both uh, metabolically quiescent and environmentally resistant spores. And you can actually see them because if you freeze fracture uh, a fruiting body, you can actually see the mixospores on the inside of it. But that's not the only pattern. So, okay, the reason why uh, I'm not gonna, I'm, the reason why development is the predominant pattern that is studied in Mixococcus anthus is that it has a verifiable endpoint. If at the end of an experiment you have visible fruiting bodies and you test them for environmentally resistant mixospores and it has mixospores, you know you've successfully undergone development. It's quantifiable. It's verifiable. But it's definitely not the only pattern that Mixococcus anthus uh, exhibits. So this is actually Mexicacus anthus swarming in time lapse on minimal nutrient iron. And um, this is about 3 million cells in an area of about a millimeter across, uh, I'd say total. You can actually see uh, individual cells or nearly individual cells. These larger groups or, or clumps of either hundreds or thousands of cells that are sort of moving. I, would, I wouldn't want to say as slugs, but they're sort of moving in unison. Uh, and as these things are moving across the agar, they're leaving behind this slime, which seems to be some, some sort of uh, uh, signaling uh, that, that they do because they, they predominantly follow slime. And if you were watching sort of different parts of this movie, you'd actually probably see a whole slew of different patterns. So, for example, you'd see swirls of, of, of cells that are moving around. Uh, or you'd see these sort of these beginning aggregates that will eventually become free bodies, at least a subset of them are, will. You see that they actually do form sort of discrete tiers of cells. Uh, there was actually a paper on that by, by Larry Shimkins not too long ago. And then last, you see these sort of rafts or, or slugs. These are hundreds or even thousands of cells that are sort of moving in unison. So, so development in the formation of fruiting bodies is not the only pattern that, exhibit, that Mixococcus anthus exhibits. exhibits a whole slew of patterns sort of on the way to it. Now, okay, this is where I come at it from, because I started out as a biochemist and molecular biologist that was interested in trying to figure out how you can get things as simple as the instructions that genes can process to make three-dimensional structures. And that was part of the reason I got interested in Mixococcus anthus, because Mixococcus anthus makes some pretty simple three-dimensional structures, and at the time I was choosing a model organism to be seen kind of far away from it anyway, so I thought, why choose something, something complicated like C. elegans? I'd choose something a lot simpler. And in 2005, we actually got the genome sequence, and it turns out that uh, Mixococcus anthus has a single circular chromosome with 9 million base pairs. 
And in those 9 million base pairs of DNA, there are approximately 7,500 open reading frames. Each open reading frame is either a gene which encodes for a protein, or at least something that looks an awful lot like a gene that encodes for a protein, but not all of them do. So we call them open reading frames. But you can assume that probably 95% of them will wind up encoding for proteins. So assume that there's about 7,500 proteins. And the function of, of well, of about 25 of them is completely unknown. So Here's actually the map, and uh, and it's color coded. So you know this is actually uh, the the, um, the role of the genes. They're sort of clustered together according to functional roles. So you've got things like uh, cell envelope and fatty acid and phospholipid metabolism, biosynthesis, and you get down you get down here to some things that are a little bit more uh, or a little less clear. Uh, protein fate cellular processes. So. You know, when I say that, that the function of approximately 25 is completely unknown, completely unknown basically means unknown function here and conserved hypotheticals, which basically means unknown function, but there's proteins of unknown function that are the same in other organisms that have been sequenced. So when you add that up, that's 25% where we either don't know what it is at all or we don't know what it is, but there's something else in another organism that we don't know what it is. But then when you look at some of these others, like, like cellular processes, like, okay, so 5.5% cellular processes, but that doesn't really tell you very much about what the protein does, really, and it doesn't tell you anything about what the protein does in light of how Mixococcus anthus functions in relation to its environment and each other. And so this is actually a slide that seems to be sort of, in a lot of the talks, since this is about emergent behavior, which is that what we've got essentially are sort of three uh, levels or three sort of uh, scales of, co of complexity. So you've got gene function. You've got individual genes or 7,500 individual genes. Each one, uh, you know, does essentially one thing. Genes are relatively simple machines. It's not like there's a lot of variability once you've, we've made it. You then have cell movement. So you've got the individual cells. We saw a movie of those. They go back and forth along their long axis. They occasionally reverse direction. They're semi-rigid rods and they only move in two dimensions. They can't swim. And then on the last, you have global self-organization, which is the idea that you can actually make patterns if you put millions of these things together and they're signaling to each other and moving in unison. And the problem is that there's actually a barrier here because each one of these scales is sort of, at this point, impossible or nearly impossible to sort of move past. So it's, it's you know, right now we're working on it, but we haven't figured out exactly how cell movement leads to global self-organization in Mixococcus anthus, or for that matter, exactly how gene function, uh, how genes function together to to control cell movement, but, and here's sort of the point of the talk at least, and the point of what my lab is trying to do right now, it's not like it's completely hopeless. We've got some things that, that we can actually use to make some predictions and maybe make some good guesses, especially about the 25% of proteins we don't know what they do. So for example, between gene function and cell, cell move, movement, well, you've got functional limitations to proteins. Proteins are infinitely complex. They do essentially one thing and one thing only, so you've got 7,000. 500 instructions that you can sort of put together in some meaningful way to include all of sort of cellular structure and metabolism, as well as things like motility in general, not to mention cooperative motility. And then you've also got the fact that at least in this case, you're dealing with prokaryotic genetics. So all of the sort of organelles and vacuoles and all the sort of complex stuff like that that you have with the eukaryotic cell, you don't have here. It's a, not a drastic oversimplification to say that a bacteria is mostly a bag of water. So you don't have as much sort of structural stuff that you have to worry about, like local concentration gradients and, and diffusions across organelles. So you've got that that simplifies this connection between the cell movement and global self-organization. Well, you've, you're dealing with an isogenic population. Granted, it may not be exactly the same. There may be differences in gene expression, say, in the middle of the swarm versus at the edge of the swarm. But over, over you know, you definitely have it. It's definitely isogenic, and it's probably more homogeneous than most self-organizing uh, uh, biological systems, and then also you have movement limitations. So the thing doesn't swim, it moves in two, in two dimensions, it only moves along this long axis, they're all rods, it's not like the cells take on different shapes. So, so you've got that, and then between gene function and global self-organization, you've got um, clustering based on gene homology. So you might not know what a gene does in a particular organism, but you can start clustering them according to sort of what they do in other organisms, or what other genes that look like it in that genome do. That didn't really make a lot of sense. Then you've got also the fact that you know it's an emergent property. I mean, you've got the patterns that are leading up to the 
to the transition from a less ordered to a more ordered state. And there are certain things that you know about emergent properties that you can guess. Like they're based on multiple interactions between relatively simple instruction sets and all that good stuff. That's actually probably one thing I don't have to talk about too much in this crowd. And so, all right. That said, here's the problem that I was facing when I sort of started attacking this problem in this organism is that we've got sort of a really limited set of tools that we can use to get any kind of quantifiable metrics. So we can measure growth rate. Like if we make a mutant in a gene, if we make a mutation in a gene, get that strain growing up, does it grow any slower? Or if we put it on auger, does the swarm expand, you know, nutrient auger, does the swarm expand any slower than normal? Uh, we can also cripple different motility systems. It turns out Mixococcus anthus has two genetically separable motility systems. We can cripple one or the other and see if maybe that changes the rate of swarm expansion. Uh, then also the rate of aggregation. Does it make fruiting bodies at a normal time? Uh, or is it delayed? And then lastly, does it make spores? So we can, again, so you see at the end of, the devel uh, end of development, we can stress the system by heating it and then seeing whether or not the spores were made, because if they weren't made, then all the cells will die, and if they are spores, then they'll be heat resistant and they'll survive. And so this is pretty much what we've got to test and use. So based on these criteria, it's been estimated the majority, somewhere around 90% of genes, are going to show no phenotype if you knock them out and then grow up the organism. They'll still do all of this stuff within some sort of statistically significant sort of near wild type level. So, all right. To all the other molecular biologists in the room, I apologize. This is a drastic oversimplification, um, but it gets the point across. So what we've done now is start taking a look, rather than individual genes that exhibit interesting phenotypes and focusing on those, to start focusing on, on the larger groups of homologous genes. So, um, so these are, are three types of genes. All of them are related to signaling. All of them might have something to do with self-organization self and in Mixococcus anthus. One are, is a group called the NTRC lake regulators, which are tar part of two component systems. And it turns out that Mixococcus anthus has a total of 53 of these in its genome. And so if you've got a signal, this little orange triangle right here, uh, it gets sensed by one protein, which passes a phosphate to another protein, which is bound to the DNA, influences transcription somehow, and makes a new product. And that influences how the cells respond to that input. You then have uh, another type called an ECF sigma factor. These are also known as one, or these are part of, of one component systems. It turns out that Mixococcus anthus has a total of 28 of those. And in this case, it's a little bit different. In this case, the signal binds to the protein. That protein itself, rather than passing a phosphate to another protein, binds to and influences the transcription of DNA, puts out another set of new signals, and can alter the cell's behavior. And then the last one that I'll bring up are the ABC transporters. Either These are importers or exporters. They can do either one. And all right, so they're not actually sensing and responding to the signal. Instead, they're sort of gated channels that could let a signal in. Once that signal's in, who knows what it could do, influence the transcription of another gene, which would produce another product, which actually might get exported by another ABC transporter. So each one of these kinds of genes could be, in, or proteins could be involved in self-organization. And it turns out there are are 120 ABC transporter systems in Mixococcus anthus. I think if you add up the genes, and sometimes there's more than one ORF related to them, it's like 198 ORFs that are in there. So the reason why I bring these up is each one of these was, or each one of these homologous families were found because one or a couple of these produced an interesting phenotype. So a researcher, either me in the case of the ABC transporters, or somebody else, actually went ahead and disrupted the rest of them, all 53 NTRC-like regulators or all ECF sigma factors, and the vast majority of them produced no phenotype that is different from wild type in any but that one that was discovered to begin with. So, all right. Um, what we decided to do was to start trying to see if we could find new metrics that we could use to differentiate between the phenotypes of these genes that right now present us with uh, with no aberrant phenotype. So before I get on to mutants, this is actually going to be development of DK1622 as wild type M. xanthus, uh, but I think on the slides I refer to it as DK1622. This again is time lapse, it's sped up, so I think every, uh, every second you're watching this is about 15 minutes in real time. This is about 6 million M. xanthus cells on starvation auger. And it doesn't take very long for them to pick points in two-dimensional space, form aggregates, and then those aggregates eventually stabilize into fruiting bodies. 
Now, if we break this up into four frames, what we notice is this. It starts out essentially as a modeled uh, bunch of gray. Uh, relatively quickly, there, there are, within a few hours, these at points of aggregation start and they grow, uh, and then, but then at some point, they go from lots here to fewer right here. And that was actually the point that we wanted to focus on. We actually didn't realize that at some point we were going to lose um, aggregates. And it turns out if you watch the movie again, you can see when that happens. First, a lot of aggregates form, and then about half of them actually, it turns out, either move and merge into other aggregates, or they just dissolve. And when we plotted that, well, before we did that, so we started looking at the at the ECS sigma factors because they were actually the most normal looking. There were 20 out of the 28, one gave us a phenotype that was a developmental defect. The other 27 looked pretty much like wild type. And so we started doing that with the with the ECS sigma factors. This is actually a mutation in the gene MXAN2405. If they just start at the top at the origin of replication and just number them from one to 7,500, so the number doesn't actually have any meaning. We made the same kind of movie here, and it goes ahead and in a reasonably timely fashion, it makes aggregates. And those aggregates actually appeared to move a little bit more than they should have, but eventually stabilize and form fruiting bodies. However, if you take plot. And on the x-axis, this is time and hours. And on the y-axis, this is actually the number of aggregates per unit area. Here's wild type. First, you see a lot of aggregates, and then it plateaus. And then uh, over a relatively short period of time, you lose about half of them, and then it stabilizes. Here's your mute. So here, instead, you get, you get a slower increase, but you actually get more aggregates. And then you don't get that they're, they're sort of merging, and so they, a few disappear over time, but you don't get this period here where you get this decrease where they're merging and disappearing. And if you look, instead of at aggregate number, if you look at aggregate size, um, here's again development in hours, and here's the average size of aggregates, and you get this little dip here right where that you, you lost a bunch of them, because if you notice the ones that were sort of shrinking and dispersing, First, they would shrink and get smaller. So this is a little transient dip in the average size of a fruiting body, and that isn't shown at all in, in MXAN2405. So, all right. Um, that's a relatively subtle but quantifiable phenotype. But there's another set of interesting element to it. In collaboration, actually, with the lab of Oleg Goshen, Oleg is developing an agent-based model based on the best that we can do in terms of, of, of a model for how aggregation occurs, which is something called the traffic jam model, which basically says that there are predetermined points based on sort of collisions and on angles where aggregates start. Those aggregates essentially are, are where cells pause, they accumulate as other cells collide with the or with sorry, with the cells that have already paused. Here's a simulation of it. And so the aggregates do form and grow and eventually stabilize. And when we take a look here at aggregate number with, with time versus the number of aggregates, uh, here's wild type. And we I shaved off the, the last little bit here in terms of time. So here is the dip in, in aggregate number for wild type. And then the dotted line here is the mutant MXAN2405. And then there's the traffic jam agent-based model is the is the debt hatch line, and if you look at aggregate size, again here's wild type with that dip, and here is the mutant 2405, and then here is the traffic jam model that just keeps on going up. So, all right, and here's the last thing, and, and again I'll probably do a poor job of explaining this. I'll apologize to Oleg to begin with. The last thing that we wanted to do is try to figure out whether or not there was any order in the placement of the fruiting bodies. Because again, we were looking for metrics that would be able to, uh, to, to differentiate between wild type and, and mutant. And so um, what Oleg came up with was actually using something that he called the cumulative radial distribution function. So uh, just to make a long, for a, for, uh, for a biologist, a long equation short, essentially you're just looking at your, it's a function that looks at the number of aggregates 
in a, in a, in a uh, circle as the circle increases, and then it generates a, radi uh, a ratio, which is the, the, mm -hmm. the frequency in, in that radius of whatever that size is over the frequency over an infinite area. And so essentially, uh, as this function approaches, um, uh, sorry, as r approaches affinity, uh, it, it, it'll go from zero when r is zero to one when, uh, when r approaches infinity. So basically, uh, if the distribution of aggregates is random, it will approach one more quickly. If the distribution of aggregates is not random, it will approach one more slowly. Uh, here is the plot of the radial distribution function for a bunch of different things, and I'll go through them one at a time. So first of all, the red line is a randomized control. So that's, that's where you know, the, the uh, location of aggregates was just randomized so that you could get the radial distribution function for that. Then the purple line here is actually the, the agent-based model. So there's the traffic jam-based agent-based model. But then here's what's kind of interesting. Um, the, um, okay, here's, uh, it actually turns out that, that the mutant actually isn't on here. That's too bad. The mutant actually is up here as well. But that um, the DK1622, so wild type in phase three, now we number those phases in the phase in which you lost a lot of fruiting bodies was actually what was phase four. So phase three was when you had a lot of aggregates before you lost about half of them. That actually is right up there with a random distribution. And by the time you hit the final distribution after you've lost about half, it actually turns out that those aren't random anymore. <coughs> and so that's another weird difference. So in addition to the mutant not losing uh, half of the fruiting bar or half of the aggregates uh, halfway through development. It also seems that wild type, when it's losing half of its aggregates, is going from a more random to a less random distribution of aggregates. So just to summarize that, uh, so DK1622, I forgot to number them, it has five distinct phases. During this fourth phase, a developing swarm of wild type loses approximately half of its aggregates. And the final arrangement of aggregates is ordered within a swarm. The arrangement of aggregates is not ordered prior to the fourth phase. And both the fourth phase and ordered aggregates are lacking in uh, MXAN2405 and the traffic jam agent-based model. All right, so I want to show you two more mutants. And these are both ECF sigma factors as well. And what you'll see is that they're, it's pretty obvious they look different from wild type. So here's one, MXAN3686. Here's the other, MXAN4773. Now again, really different from wild type, but at the end of the day, you've got aggregates that have spores in them. As far as a mix of biologists is concerned, they're wild type, even though they're clearly different in the way that they make aggregates. So, now this is very new data, uh, so um, it's we're still sort of developing. This is actually a, the work of a brand new graduate student in my lab. He's actually sitting in the back, I feel. Um, where we were trying to figure out, again, another metric where we could differentiate from, wild, from mutants from wild types. So Phil is actually an expert in image processing. So he took, and I, and, and I, I told him that he didn't have to know anything about M. Xanthus, just take a look at these movies and see if he could come up with features that would differentiate one set from the other. So here's actually a piece of one, uh, one movie. And what he did is he, he measured the change in pixel intensity uh, for each pixel for frames uh, n minus 1 and n, each frame in a movie of, let's say, 600 frames. Then he eliminated, uh, so, so what that does is, and then he color coded one red and one green. Now, of course, everywhere where you lose pe in pixel intensity, you're going to gain it somewhere else. So it actually sort of averages that to zero. So instead, he eliminated all the pixels that showed a decrease in pixel intensity, and then he plotted over time the sum of increasing pixels, both in number and intensity, for wild type of mutants. So this is just an example of wild types that are DK 1622. This is the total upward intensity increase of, of sort of an entire 
uh, frame or a set of frames, and this is over 24 hours of development, so this is actually in frames, the x-axis here, and here's what's interesting. So we did this for two sets of, you know, two independent wild types, and then for both of those mutants you just saw. And so here's wild type A and B, so those are two independent repeats, and then here's one mutant and then another, and then here's, again, the other mutant and then again. So it looks like this, at least we're on to something, where again, this would be another way of looking at, uh, at two movies of two different developing strains and seeing whether or not we can differentiate between the two of them. So, all right, um, where am I going with this? Because that doesn't really make a lot of sense to some of my colleagues. Um, so we're going to continue to make insertion disruption mutants for sets of ores. Not just, uh, not just sets of uh, homologous uh, families that may be involved in signaling, but especially also the hypotheticals. But we need a set that's big enough so that we can start um, we can start clustering them according to these features that we're developing. Then we're going to develop new features and characterize uh, these mutant strains at swarm scale. So the kind of stuff we're showing here, I'm hoping to actually maybe come up with, if not dozens, hundreds of metrics that we can use to analyze these things and start differentiating between them. And then we're going to actually start grouping the open reading frames, uh, the mutants, by clustering them according to feature characterization. So. This sort of comes at it the way that I saw um, people dealing with microarray data. So we, you know, we just went through sort of a, a, a lost half decade where every molecular biologist was trying to cluster microarray data. But the clustering was actually interesting because it didn't have to be just expression data. You can cluster just about anything. So what essentially we're going to do is develop a feature set for each one of these mutant strains, and then cluster the the mutants that we characterize based on this set of features. And then lastly, um, to, to start examining, you know, when we have a cluster of genes that all seem to behave the same way at global scale, then we'll go in with fluorescently tagged cells and we'll start examining the behavior of individual cells and then incorporating that behavior into the agent-based model to see if we can't get closer and closer to a point where the agent-based model reflects what we're actually looking at at a global scale. And then the obligatory acknowledgement slide. Um, so uh, this work is done, Oleg and I have been collaborating since Oleg was a graduate student and I was a postdoc, and so I, I guess, you know, Oleg does the theory, I do the experiments, but I can't really tell you which one of the ideas is mine and which one's Oleg's because um, we're in communication so much, so that's, so that just said. Uh, and then um, Chin Yuan Yan and, uh, and Claire, actually, that, that's how, what, how she prefers to be called, are both graduate students in my lab. Chinyuan is doing most of the mutant generation, and Claire is actually our new microscope expert. And Phil was the one who, who did the, uh, the image analysis, the second one that I showed you. And then Stuart Angus, and Stuart Angus actually got started on a lot of this stuff. He was an undergraduate here. He's now a PhD student at the University of Chicago. And Brandon Mansfield actually just graduated this fall and is now a PhD student at Pittsburgh. And and, oh, and I would also like to, to thank NSF for, for funding this through uh, through a career award. Um, but I always forget to thank them. That's a bad thing to do. But thank you very much. This is, I mean, those pictures, I'm very excited, you know, looking at those clustering pictures because they work on similar issues on clustering in glioma cells. And uh, my question the, 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 is the cells? Glioma, oh, cancer, okay. cancer, glioma cells. So uh, in uh, physics and material science, there is a process uh, co co uh, called coarsening, where uh, you start with a homogeneous system, and then due to phase separation, uh, clusters appear, and the, the uh, process is the following. Uh, small clusters lose cells, and, and those cells uh, uh, attach to larger clusters. So larger clusters grow at the expense of smaller ones. Now, in this situation, the number of clusters decreases all the time, and the average size of, of a cluster of clusters increases. Now, in your case, I see that the system freezes at some point. So the cluster 
size distribution function doesn't change it anymore. So could you, do you have some intuitive explanations of, of what happens? Why, why you know, cells stop proliferating and moving? Theory, you're talking about Oswald right now, right? Yes. Um, so, so I actually, Stuart started using terms like that. And I, I called up Oleg with that idea. And, and Oleg basically said that I needed to do more reading and I shouldn't use those terms until I really know what they mean. Um, so, uh, yes, that, that's, that's our guess as to what's happening. And actually, uh, Claire's project right now is to tag, so we have a system where we can tag, uh, tag cells fluorescently. I actually think I decided not to use one of these. Um, we also get Lee's gang rings, uh, where we can tag cells fluorescently. And we got, there it is. No, that's not it. There we go. Tag cells fluorescently and then track them. And these are actually, that's a, the aggregate that's growing, and these are individual cells that are moving toward it. And so we're now going to repeat this experiment for aggregates that are increasing in size and aggregates that are diminishing and seeing whether or not we can see a difference in the number of cells that are leaving the aggregates that are diminishing because that would actually be a strong indication of course, right? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is fantastic. I just don't understand why, why this freezes at the end. So why cells stop, stop moving at, 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 at some point? Yeah, I mean, at, at some point, like, you know, yeah, no, this isn't a, it's not just a physical phenomenon. There's a, there's a genetic element to it as well. So there's probably some genetic signal that turns on and tells them all, like, enough's enough. Okay, um, I have a couple of quick questions. The first is about, you kind of mentioned that the traffic jam model is based on the assumption that collisions cause kind of local pauses and then aggregates form around that, which makes me wonder if you have or if you've thought about um, putting in some kind of little posts that act as obstacles to try to nucleate aggregates in specific areas. Um, so that's actually one of the, the things that makes working with, with Mixo. Mixo is, for those of us that are on a first name basis with it, that's what we call it. Um, so Mixo will make a fruiting body on almost anything. So a glass bead, a little piece of dirt, you hit your pipette tip on the auger, it'll make a fruiting body right there. So we actually go to, to Herculean efforts to try to avoid anything like that. But yes, if there's an object that sort of gets in its way, it tends to sort of cluster around it, and it will actually make a fruiting body there. But that means that you can have a possibility of, say, making an ordered array of where the fruiting bodies would appear, and then seeing what that does for the interactions of the aggregates. Yeah, that might be a, a really interesting idea. Um, and then just another quick question. One of the different big differences, it seems like, in the difference between the wild type and aggregates is that the wild type actually takes a lot longer to start forming aggregates initially. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. So we, we've, gotten, uh, we've gotten variations in both directions. So the, the, the ones that we showed you, I guess, you know, look like they form, form more quickly. Actually, the, the last two mutants that I showed you, the two that that I sort of showed you one after the other. Those, I don't know if they were started right at t equals it. So you set up these slides, and you basically have to clamp them and incubate them, and it might sometimes take some time to sort of get that started. And then you've got to get the microscope started, so there's some time variation in there. So by the time you're ready to do a slide that actually is a solid experiment, like you have that all set up, but those two might have been started like an hour late. So, so what's t equals zero isn't necessarily well defined. It, it's it's well defined when we're actually getting publishable data. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I have two questions. Um, do you know what is the mechanism why they aggregate? Is it like you know access or something? <laughs> well, so it, it's 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 kind of an interesting example of of well, in my opinion, a convergent evolution between this and another much more complicated organism called Dictostelium discoidium, because they look really similar. I mean, Dictostelium discoidium is amoeba, it's a slime mold, and it does many of the same things. It forms aggregates, it forms fruiting bodies with these spores, and it makes, you know, so. But in the case of Dictostelium, it is chemotaxis. But in Mexicacus anthus, it appears not to be. In fact, 
they've spent you know a couple of decades trying to find chemotactic signals, and no one has been able to, to identify a diffusible signal that Mixo will chemotax toward as an individual cell. Um, that said, it doesn't it, you know sort of not identifying something is never proof that it doesn't exist, but in biology, it's really hard to prove that something doesn't exist. We should talk because I think somebody <laughs> came to my lab with the same organism asking me to test for chemotaxis for, for one of the chemicals, but I don't remember what it is. So, so it, will, we should, we it should. will chemotax as a swarm to certain things, right. but individual cells don't seem to be able to do that. Well, that's, we should talk, so that's not the case in uh, this is the next It's very short, but we will come. Some groups in Mexico have been in this feel that an alteration in the frequency of reversal it constitutes chemotaxis, but one of the definitions of chemotaxis is that the cell actually has to get somewhere. And so simply changing or going from this to this is not chemotaxis because you're not actually getting anywhere. So I don't know whether that's the experiment you're talking about, but a change in reversal frequency is not something that I define as chemotaxis. Uh -huh. um, the other question is, does the aggregate always happen in any kind of alga, or do you have to manipulate the mechanical stiffness of the alga, or humidity, or something? What is the, is it too easy to get aggregates, or you have to manipulate the situation to make it happen? In mixococcus anthus, it's relatively easy, but that was the reason why that organism was chosen. Other mixobacterial species also make fruiting bodies, but they tend to be a lot more finicky. Stigmatella ranthiaca, uh, serangium cellulose. And, um, some mixobacteria, like Enermixobacter the halogenans, actually doesn't seem to make fruiting bodies. But mixococcus anthus was chosen because it makes them pretty reliable. Um, does does mixo express uh, uh, or rather, does it excrete strong biosurfactants, and does it, it ever produce lots of uh, extracellular matrix like other species? Does that play a role in its mechanical properties and formation of fruiting bodies? So, like a like a, a normal biofilm, it, it sort of exists in its own self-generated matrix. Uh, exactly what constitutes it is still somewhat unknown. It, makes this stuff called slime. <laughs> um, this is something that biologists get to do, uh, where we, we don't know what it is, so we describe what it, or we name it according to what it looks like. Um, the kind and exactly what slime is made up of, we don't know. There is actually a hypothesis that it's part of the propulsion system, that the extrusion of slime is actually what drives them forward. Other people don't believe in that. Some people that just think it's a form of stingergy, where you know essentially one cell lays down a slime trail and then and, and does that include some surfactants as well, do you think? Or, you know, I, I would assume so, but I don't know. Okay. Could, could you explain more why you expect some analogy with uh, oscillate ripening? Because I don't see at all the uh, connection. Um, okay, this is probably why Oleg told me not to mention it. <laughs> um, so so what, I, what I'd like to do is, is talk with you and that guy, and then maybe the two of you can get to fighting, and I don't have to sound stupid. So I, I, I don't need to fight. I'm just trying to understand, but I don't understand. So, so well, I, you know, I'm not sure I do either. So, well, how about the three ball? Okay, I'll buy you guys sure. Sure. Yeah, so, so I, I, I think it's not real the the, the, the ring, but I think it's basically a combination of in the same conditions there. Uh, the same cells are doing two different things. We have two sub phenotypes. One of them are spreaded, the other one are aggregated. Basically, we have some cells spread, then they decide to aggregate. When they aggregate, some of them die, so uh, uh, the rest get the food, they keep on spreading, it gets an, an, another side. So I think the mechanism, the internal mechanism, are, are, is quite different from the statistical mechanics of, of, of the output. So may, may, maybe at some abstract level equation might be similar, but we couldn't figure that out. I have, I have a couple questions about the, just the movies. It wasn't so clear to me what I was seeing. I saw these like gray, kind of uniform things, and then I saw these black things forming. And can you just explain a little bit what 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 I was seeing there? Am I seeing the individual cells? Does that make sense? 
So, so you know, the, the, the self-generated matrix that I was talking about sort of makes it so that the individual cells are obscured. So the, the, the swarm appears as sort of one entity, even though it is composed of millions of cells. Uh, so I, I apologize for not making that clear. That's one of those, when I give a talk to microbiologists, I leave out stuff, and I shouldn't have. So that, the, the movies that you're referring to were made with straight up normal bright field microscopy, which basically means that there is some relationship, it's assumed to be somewhat linear between the, the darkness and the density of what the light is shining through. So you can assume that the, the grayer areas are more cells piled up on, each, on top of each other in that region, and the lighter areas are fewer cells. So you're looking essentially at, at density, and then the aggregates, the black circles that you were looking at, are the, the fruiting bodies that are sort of growing, so they have now essentially reached the threshold of, of black, and are now sort of completely black, even though they have a dome shape, you can't sort of see what the shape is based on the grayscale. So are you assuming that they're hemispherical? Because I would ass I would guess the model must make some kind of prediction about how uh, they exist in the third dimension, but your images don't uh, allow you to deduce that. So, uh, so then when you're counting like whether or not, when you were doing all these statistics on the things disappearing and growing, it, I mean, another possibility is they could just be changing their height in the third dimension, but there should be definite predictions from the model about what's going on and have to check those. So, so that that's actually a, a, a couple of good points. Let me sort of handle them one at a time. So, actually, one of the first guys that I ever collaborated with was a, a guy named um, Adam Arkin, who was at, at Berkeley, and he he was helping me model some stuff. And I remember getting a question very much like that about the third dimension, and sort of stumbling on it. And he interrupted me and just said, you know, look, the pattern's two dimensional, so we can model it in two dimensions. And it's still something we're studying, even if we don't see the third dimension. So we're actually sort of modeling the third dimension separately. Uh, but it adds a level of complexity, which I don't think is a bad thing to treat separately in terms of image analysis. You're right, in terms of modeling. Once they get there, they simply can't stop. One of the other guys that, that does modeling, a guy named Mark Elbert, Notre Dame, he did models Mixococcus That's essentially what happens is that fruiting bodies are just places where cells stop. Uh, and absolutely, if it's making a defined shape, it's doing something. They're doing something to make that shape, but we haven't gotten there yet. And then just finally, in the images, at certain points, I saw like these waves of black and white appearing in the gray, and they would appear and disappear. So what, what's going on with that? What sets the wavelength of those? And uh, I, I would say it's a very good question. Why, why don't we discuss it over the coffee? Because we are running a little bit late. But I, I just know it's a, it's a subject of a separate talk. The way it makes it represent. So let's think, uh, thank uh, Roy and all the speakers. So, uh, Coffee is here now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>